wanting, I believe, to end this uh, failed policy towards Cuba for five decades. But uh, actually, it's interesting to note how he was pressured, uh, not just by the European nations, but specifically by the Latin American nations. So this photograph that you see here was taken in, in April at the Summit of the Americas, when for the first time since the revolution, American and Cuban presidents shook hands, and that happened because America was told in no uncertain terms by the host nation, Panama, that unless there was rapprochement with Cuba, the summit of the Americas would not welcome America, USA. And the first person that the Panamanian president invited was Raul Castro. Uh, and so the, our Cuba policy all these decades had been disarticulating our regional policy. So enough on that, that was the, the background to it. And um, amongst the changes that came into effect in January, announced in December 17th by Obama, were changes to the travel restrictions. Very important to note, President Obama cannot lift the travel ban. That is the bailiwick of US Congress. And so you see the good news here, every US citizen can legally travel to Cuba, but. Uh, there are restrictions. And so because the Supreme Court many, many years ago affirmed that the US government may not restrict the freedom of US citizens to travel, they invoke the 1917 Woodrow Wilson era <laughs> Trading with the Enemy Act to prevent us trading with Cuba. And that includes travel. It is not illegal to travel to Cuba. It is illegal to trade with Cuba, right? And again, so it's Congress that has control of this, and Obama can only tinker around the edges, and he has done so to the broadest uh, ability that he currently has. And so in December, the second week of, uh, sorry, the second week of January, the new regulations issued by Obama came into effect. And so there are 12 categories of individuals that are legally permitted to travel to Cuba. And until the new regulations came into effect, the majority of those categories, those individuals needed to request a specific license from the Treasury Department. The Treasury, uh, and specifically the Office of Foreign Asset Controls, part of the Treasury oversee this because it's trading with the enemy. And so they, they could always say, no, you can't go to Cuba. What Obama did was change the category of license to make it what's called a general license, and it is essentially pre-approval. It is now on a system. If you fall within, I know you can't read these very well, but journalists, religious, humanitarian figures, people going for very specific reasons, which means most of you in the audience cannot go uh, under those categories, um, but if you fall within those categories, you can simply go to Cuba and the US government will now take it at face value that if you declare that you fit one of these categories, you can now go um, and have a good time. However, there are responsibilities, and so the law states that you must record your journey uh, and do so and keep these books, little booklets, for five years and just like, like the IRS can come knocking on your door for seven years saying, show me your tax receipts, then the Treasury Department, at least in theory, can come knocking on your door for five years and ask for these little booklets. So, um, the Moon Guidebook, uh, you know, are all here to purchase the Moon Cuba Guidebook, correct? <laughs> or just a banner, we have the new Moon Good man. The Moon Havana Guidebook, or at least one royalty coming my way at the back there. Um, I do outline all the specifics. So if you fall within these 12 legal categories, you can now fly direct from the States. It's just a 40 minute flight from Miami to Havana. It's rather remarkable to think that Cuba is so close and yet it is, I call the Florida Strait, the deepest moat in the world. Uh, nonetheless, you can book through a charter company, you see we fly American Airlines, 40-minute uh, flight. You can't book on American Airlines, you go to AA.com, you're not going to see it. It's a charter flight, but American operates the flight on behalf of licensed charter companies. And they handle your visa. You check in for your flight or you get the paperwork with your airline ticket, and here is your Cuban visa. It's all handled for you. It's a very, very easy process. Um, and then just last month, Obama's administration licensed five 
ferry companies to begin ferry service. They have not yet started. Of course, the Cubans need to approve it. But the writing is on the wall, the way we're going here. This is looking better and better every day. Now, it doesn't mean that you can then ship your car over like you could in the old days and just do a self-drive holiday because that's a different department. A car would be an export and that is absolutely illegal, would require getting the com commerce department involved. You don't need that headache and it's not going to happen anytime soon. But the, the wind is in our sails for those who believe of, in, in ending this ridiculous uh, failed policy in full. Now, other good news. You consider yourself a legal traveler, then you are now since January, for the first time, permitted to book online any of the facilities you need to make your travel to Cuba happen. So you are now permitted to use your credit cards. That was barred, by the way. Under the Bush administration, it became illegal to use a credit card in any form with the intent of traveling to Cuba. That's now lifted. You can book your room rental on Airbnb, pay by credit card, and book your air on cheap air, and go by whatever means of transportation. You are pre-authorized to do it. If you're a journalist, if you, yeah. etc. But if you state you are, that's also considered fine as long as you keep the documentation. More good news. Not only do you get to smoke your cigars, you are now permitted to bring $100 worth of cigars and or rum back from Cuba. Yeah. Okay. So, well, what about the bad news? All right, so there is bad news here, and that is that tourism, recreational travel, is not allowed. Now, it seems that the regulations have been written so that there will be no oversight by the Treasury Department. So it seems that there's no real policing going on, but we have a November 2016 election coming up. Ted Cruz wins, Marco Rubio wins, Jeb Bush wins. It could swing the other way and they could come knocking on your door and say, what were those photos you posted on Facebook having a happy good time drinking mojitos on the beach? So this is not allowed unless it is for people-to-people -people interaction. And this is what everybody in this room is here to hear about. What is people-to-people -people interaction? It is the one category that allows every U.S. citizen to legally travel to Cuba tomorrow. So, we have a little bit of a legal people-to-people uh, -people encounter with my motorcycle. This is early in March this year. You really can't see it very well. And it's not in focus. I see it now. I have to step down and focus it. That will drive me crazy. Yeah, you want that. The male, the men here need that. Yeah, but what about us? All right, well, that's about it. Well, <laughs> no. I, I wish this were at 8 o'clock so we could have a... You can really see them. But anyway, so what is people to people? So amongst those 12 categories of legally, legal, uh, legally permissible travel is educational travel. It was initially for academic travel, students, professors, etc. But there is a clause within the educational activity that states, and I have to read it to you, this general license authorizes persons subject to U.S. jurisdiction to engage in certain educational exchanges in Cuba under the auspices of an organization that sponsors such exchanges to promote people-to-people -people contact that will result in meaningful interaction between U.S. citizens and Cubans. Essentially, we call it a tour, but we can't use the term, and so many organizations have jumped on this bandwagon. There are dozens of them leading people-to-people -people trips. Last year, 98,000 Americans participated in people-to-people -people trips. That is already up 40% in the first four months of this year since the relaxation of the regulations. And this is a people-to-people -people encounter with my very close friend. He's beyond friend. He's a brother to me. Julio Munoz, you can't see it very well, but you see two little, the horse and the foal in the house, 18th century colonial house in Trinidad, and there is one of my National Geographic expedition groups in a people-to-people -people encounter. He's teaching us about his efforts 
to teach Monty Robert type better equine care to the country folk and or horse owners of Cuba. That is a classic people to people encounter. And you can all join one of those groups, I should add, very important. As long as there are four people involved, you can have a program arranged for you by one of the any entity that uh, wants to travel entity that wants to offer offer a people-to-people -to -people tour and they no longer need to be specific licensed. If uh, your travel agent down the road is now pre-authorized to arrange a people-to-people -people trip for you, as long as there are four people properly designed, you can do it. So take your daughters, your husband or whatnot, you can do it that way. So this is a people-to-people -people encounter and the great thing I love about it it, in a sense, forces you into the field with the field hands. Yeah. So this is March, and you're going, what the heck? That's a brand new BMW motorcycle in there. This is outside Guantanamo. What's that doing there? Well, that's because, as Lee hinted to you, in 1996, I'd already been going to Cuba for four years. I shipped my BMW to Cuba and uh, spent three months there, and that was the... Uh, research vehicle that I used to produce the first edition of what is now the Moon Cubic book. The sixth edition just came out. Uh, by the way, I've told them to lock the doors. Nobody's leaving till you all have a copy <laughs> in, in your hands. Uh, and also, as a result of it, I was very, very fortunate that I was giving a presentation on the Moon Cuba book at the National Press Club in Washington. And the travel head of travel book division at National Geographic was in the audience. And um, in my presentation, I referenced the fact that I just finished a literary book. And she asked to see it. And lo and behold, National Geographic published my book about motorcycling through Cuba. And ever since, I'd had a dream. And that was to lead group motorcycle tours in Cuba. So it was in 2011 that Obama created the people to people license category. So I applied on behalf of a friend of mine with his company, Moto Discovery in Texas. All he does is motorcycle tours around the world. We applied for a license, and it was denied. The Treasury Department said that's recreation, and we do not allow recreation. So I rewrote the application, and I said, no, we're not recreating. We are using the motorcycles just like we need a bus to get between people-to-people -people encounters. They gave us the license, and ever since I've been leading motorcycle tours. Uh, but mostly I'm now also, I lead, uh, I led 12 tours this year to Cuba for National Geographic Expeditions. These are people-to-people -people programs, and you can all sign up, and I hope you will do so. And you go to my website, ChristopherBaker.com, and you'll see uh, the relevant section under Tour Leader. Uh, but what's also interesting this year, since January, uh, you're all familiar with Backroads, the local company in, in Berkeley. Uh, Backroads row, row adventures out of um, Idaho and now scuba diving programs. They're all, a lot of these companies are introducing purely recreational travel. They are pushing beyond what the law allows. Mm -hmm. I suspect their attorneys, uh, hopefully they've got the attorney's advice, are probably telling them Treasury is not policing this right now. I say be careful. Uh, and it's interesting that I wrote the Backroads application, license application, four years ago. It was denied because Backroads, as you know, does bicycling and walking. We rewrote the application using my lessons from the motorcycling tours experience. And uh, Backroads was granted a license. But I saw the letter from Treasury Department. It said you may not offer bicycling and walking. So the first two years that Backroads did their trips in Cuba was the only time they had a tour that had no recreational activity. Now they do, but I say they are pushing uh, the, beyond the edge of what is legally permissible. Anyway, as to scuba diving, I'm not sure you want to go. <laughs> anyway, so um, the options, the door is really wow. wide open and now is the time to go. And as of last week, you're probably aware that the first cruise ship license was offered. This was Carnival Cruise Lines, which uh, founded a new division. They, they have various um, companies under their umbrella, so they created Fathom Cruises. Ostensibly, it was just going to be Dominican Republic doing volunteerism cruises. And I said to myself, wonderful idea, I love it, but do you have enough clientele to fill a cruise ship? 700 passengers every week doing volunteerism in the DR. 
I thought this is not it. And last week they announced it's all about Cuba. They got the license to run cruises under the people to people license. And as of two days ago, two other cruise companies came in with their licenses granted. So the, we don't know where it's going. It's all, uh, all this. So this is the, one of the major second companies and it is Globus Gateway. Now, if you know Globus, this is mass market tourism, right? So they are chartering this vessel. This is not a cruise company. This is mass market. So you can see that the flood is potentially beginning if Cuba chooses to allow it. And I'm not sure I like the look of that, like these lemmings. I have to read it because you can't see it. These are the lemmings going over the cliff and it says, wait a minute something feels wrong yeah. okay. so uh, on that note let's begin the profile on what Cuba is I'm going to give you Cuba 101 for those who haven't been this photograph is of a hotel uh, in Havana that opened about 10 years ago and the week that it opened I was getting a tour with one of the executives and I was in this beautiful bar this mezzanine bar and the elevator doors opened and a naked man stepped out. <laughs> okay, he had a towel, we'll give him that. Um, and he was trailing water like a fish and he had clearly been on the rooftop swimming pool and he walked across the lobby through the bar like this, sorry, and the executive and I are absolutely astonished, jaws down by our knees, we didn't say anything, and watched him go down the marble staircase into the uh, reception and heading for the street. And, and I couldn't believe my eyes. And the receptionist intercepted him and said to him in English, I'm sorry, sir, we don't allow guests dressed like this in the lobby. And in the broadest American brogue, he turned and said, yeah, I know. And of course, I put my hands in my head and thought, is this a scene from Faulty Towers? <laughs> or is this Cuba's future writ large when the travel restrictions are lifted, right? So there you are. So what is your experience? You arrive in Cuba, and the very first thing that hits you straight out of the airport is, oh my God, I'm in a time warp. I have stepped back into the 1950s because one quarter of all the cars in Cuba are uh, these old, old American cars. So these are images from a coffee table book that I did that you could order from this bookstore, Cuban Classics, a celebration of vintage American automobiles. And they are all there, all there. All the cars you can imagine are present on the streets, in use. They're not uh, garage queens or whatever the term is, uh, including the Edsels. I guarantee you, remember the Edsel? This company only existed for two and a half years. Every day in Cuba, you're going to see an Edsel. And there were more Cadillacs in Havana than any city in the States, which I say is reason enough to visit because they're all still on the road. So where else in the world could you possibly take a photograph tomorrow like that? Only Havana. So this is a time warp, it is surreal. It's one of those places that I say is ri literally like stepping into a romantic novel because you have the Hollywood setting that Hollywood couldn't even pay enough money. They could only dream of this kind of setting. Uh, and then the second impression you have is that you're only 90 miles from the malls and McDonald's of Miami, but you are in the only socialist I'll put that in inverted commas, socialist country in the Western Hemisphere. And so forget all the billboards out there, uh, buy this, buy that, and buy the other. What you're going to get is the revolutionary fervor and the, the socially progressive messages um, everywhere. And of course it reaches its uh, peak, if you will, a zenith with this phrase from Fidel, Patria o muerte, fatherland or death, and this was really to invoke um, uh, a passionate nationalism. If, if the U.S. ever decided to send the Marines into Cuba, this was the response. We are all going to martyr ourselves, fatherland or death. So you see that frequently throughout Cuba. Um, but the most prominent figure, the personality that appears most ubiquitously, is of course Che Guevara, who was from what country? Argentina, right? Many people associate him with Cuba because, of course, he came to fame through the Cuban Revolution. But yes, he was an Argentinian, trained as a doctor, came from a, what was 
defined, of course, as a bourgeois middle-class family, well-educated, doctored, took off on his voyage uh, on motorcycle, um, ended up in Mexico, met Raul Castro. Raul and Fidel were in Mexico, establishing a rebel army to come back to Cuba, and I'm going to give you that part of the history and further along, uh, and launched the armed struggle to overthrow the Batista dictatorship. And he signed on as a doctor, but he became Castro, or the revolution's most prominent and most capable military commander. Mm -hmm. And after the revolution, he became, he was given Cuban citizenship, only the second person ever to receive it, and was named the Minister of Banking, Finance, and Industry. So, a joke. You want a joke? Yeah. Okay, Shea apparently liked to tell this joke. How did he become Minister of Banking, Finance, and Industry? Well, there's a meeting of the Commandantes after the revolution, and Shea is there, and Fidel asks for an economist. And Shea puts his hand up, and Fidel says, you'll be Minister of Banking, Finance, and Industry. By the end of the meeting, all the ministerial positions are apportioned, and Shea goes up to Fidel and says, Shea, why did you make me Minister of Banking, Finance, and Industry? Fidel says, well, I asked for an economist. An economist? I thought you asked for a communist. <laughs> and this is very, very relevant because uh, Che Guevara dreamed of building a society that based on altruistic principle. And he firmly held the conviction that they could eradicate money and operate a society in which money didn't exist and he was the Minister of Banking and Finance. And this is truly ironic because these days he is the most marketable product in Cuba. And you see him on everything from t-shirts to teacups. And I hope you can see this one at the back. That is Che Guevara in cinnamon on a coffee cup. So it's rather remarkable where Che Guevara shows up. Well, now is the time to visit Cuba for various reasons, not least, of course, before the American flood arrives, but more importantly, I think, because you can capture Cuba right now, not just in a moment in time as it was, but in a moment in time as it will be. Raul, uh, as you know, in 2006, uh, Fidel Castro was taken very seriously ill, but barely survived. It's a state secret in Cuba, by the way. All, Cu all, all the family life of Fidel is a secret. Uh, you ask a Cuban what's the wife's name, they don't even know if he's married, seriously. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun, I have a lot of fun with that. Uh, and you ask what was his illness, nobody has a clue. I'll tell you, it was diverticulitis, so he had his bowel removed. But anyway, the end result was that his younger brother, now 83, Raul Castro, took over. And they are cut from different cloth. I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Fidel in October 2003, and it was one of those things where you get the measure of a person instantly. Uh, definition of walking ego, by the way, that's how I, if there was one word I could would use, that would be it. But Raul is, is a very humble man, very different, mm. and he's a passionate communist, but he, he changed the tune immediately and said, enough with all this bullshit about the anti-USA, down with the USA, the US embargo, let's face the fact that we've screwed up. That is the message that we took on, on the first speech he gave and ever since. And so he has initiated reforms within Cuba that are intent on sponsoring private enterprise and getting 1.5 million state workers into self-employment because the bureaucrats are kicking and screaming. Uh, but nonetheless, so there are now 206 categories of private employment are allowed, and this is one, this is a watchmaker. You have barbers, these are all service industries, every one of them. You have artists such as my close friend Lazaro, does these incredible uh, bas-relief wooden carvings on colonial door panels. Uh, you have private room rentals, this is the big growth area, Airbnb has more than 2,000 of these Cuban uh, rentals online right now. And then the private restaurants, this is where the big money is, is um, going. When I say big money, last year, three billion, with a B, dollars was transferred from Miami to Cuba as family remittance. A month, that's a lot of money. Three billion, and much of that is being involved in private, invested in private enterprise, and specifically 
private restaurants. There is a culinary revolution going on in Cuba that is very exciting. If you had gone to, to Cuba 10 years ago and complained about the food, I would have said, I understand. These days you cannot complain about the food. There is world-class food being served in Cuba in world-class restaurants. Uh, and then of course you get private nightclubs. Incredibly, the, the state is now leasing properties to individuals investing in private nightclubs. This is actually privately owned. This is a former Italian fashion model, my friend Elisa and her Cuban partner. But this is the new Cuba evolving before my eyes. Now I've seen more change in the last three years in Cuba than in the prior two decades to that that I've been visiting Cuba. Uh, another reason to go. And then you get the classic cars. Here's another Edsel. This is my my pal Urbano. I was there just as an aside uh, two months ago filming reality shows, sizzle reels, uh, demos with a company and uh, I was driving this around and my god I have a new appreciation for the drivers of these cars. I was sweating at the end of that. It's like driving a battleship down the road. But anyway, so you can hire one. And so these guys, this driver Urbano I know makes about as much in one hour as uh, a doctor would in a month in Cuba given the salary level. So there's this big transfer of wow. people wanting to move into private enterprise by whatever means they can. So there's a new Cuba emerging and Obama's changes, Obama's reforms as much as anything else mm -hmm. beyond the fact that we have in my eyes a constitutional right to unrestricted travel to Cuba. Uh, this is intended to support the initiatives coming out of Raul in terms of private enterprise. And there's further liberalization that I won't go into right now on the political front and uh, human freedom speech front. Um, but anyway, the reality for Cubans is that very few Cubans can afford uh, to dine in these paladares. I just mentioned the average doctor's salary had been about $30 a month. Uh, Raul has uh, increase that by sixfold for doctors to stop the brain drain into private enterprise of doctors. And so many Cubans still to this day rely on the ration system. The state uh, supplies everybody with the basics every month, even if you are a millionaire, and there are millionaires in Cuba, you have this right. One of the things I do on all my tours is I get you into a bodega to learn about the rationing system, right? I want you to understand the reality of Cuba. And, uh, and if, uh, that, of course, the state can only supply uh, a certain amount of one's basic needs. If you don't have access to foreign, foreigners' money, if you don't have act working in tourism, if you don't have family remittances, then you are going to have to struggle to find a way. Uh, so most Cubans, I say, are self-employed. They cannot exist on the state salary. And the private markets, as Raul is liberalizing and getting out of the state distribution control, private markets have blossomed and so they fill the gap and so they're all part of the new process you need to go to Cuba and see. I threw this in at the last minute, I wasn't sure whether to show it, uh, but this, I want to, to teach you some of the distinctions. I've been inside this house, this is the head of Fidel's security, he actually is retired and now rents it, that's how I got in there and this was of course dispossessed of some unfortunate Cuban American who I had to leave Cuba. If you left Cuba after the revolution, you lost everything. Um, and many Cubans are living, you can't see it very well, but they're living in conditions like this. Um, but I will speak to the progressive things that the socialist revolution have done in a short while. But anyway, there's this broad dichotomy. Did they get to an equal society? No. And the language coming out of Raul is fascinating. Where Fidel had said we're all equal, etc., um, Raul is saying we're not equal, we'll never be equal, that's absurd, right? What we're doing is creating equal opportunity, and what you do with that opportunity is up to you, and you are able to keep your rewards. So we're talking almost like a quasi, sounds like Donald Trump on the, right. on the stump, doesn't it? Anyway, so enough on the politics, what about the physical beauty of the place? Well, how many people have been to Pundicana, Dominican Republic? Forget it. Beautiful. I'm not going to denigrate it. I've done two books on Dominican Republic. I love it. But can you imagine Punta Cana stretching for 300 miles unbroken? 
That's what you get yeah. off the Northern Keys. So the three million tourists went to Cuba last year and 80% of those people stayed in the all-inclusive resorts on the Northern Keys with these beaches that run for miles and miles, as you see here, with these, these shallows extending to the coral reefs. So they have an immense capacity yet to fulfill. I, got the, I haven't seen it in a while, but I had the Master Cuban Tourism Plan for developing uh, about 15 years ago, and uh, they have only done a pinprick in terms of their potential about much infrastructure they can put in. This, by the way, you can't see it very well, but this is a lobster. This was my lunch coming ashore. I described this in Mimoto Fidel. I took this photograph in 1996 on the motorcycle journey. And this was my lunch coming ashore because at Cayo Sabinal, where I stayed, I stayed in a thatched hut, and there were no, there's no hotels to this day there nor a restaurant. So I had a choice of red snapper or lobster, as I described. And then you get the physical, uh, the beauty of the, the mountains and whatnot. Here is uh, the oldest city in Cuba, 1511. This is Baracoa, with this incredible mountain formation. A wonderful thing about Baracoa. And any motorcyclists in the room? <laughs> All right, Jim, you're coming with me I am. on one of the motorcycle tours. We take you to Baracoa. One of the interesting people-to-people -people encounters we have is with the only remaining indigenous community. You take a look at this guy, you can instantly see Taino blood, Taino pre-Columbian uh, indigenous blood. And there is the only place in Cuba where you will find a regional cuisine. And that, again, is heavily influenced by the, uh, both the fact that the environment there permits cacao and other produce to be grown that can't be grown elsewhere, but there's the legacy of the uh, indigenous population. My favorite location, I am, I am beside myself that you can't see these slides uh, very well, but anyway, uh, is Vinales Valley. This is three hours west of Havana, and this is where the tobacco is grown that is the finest tobacco in the world, or goes into rolling the finest cigars in the world. and. Uh, so you can go to a, a cigar factory, there are five of them in Havana that make for export, and learn the whole process of whether it is actually true that Cuban cigars owe their uniquely uh, desirable flavor to having been rolled on the thighs of dusky maidens. <laughs> it's a misnomer, but in fact the leaves are indeed sorted on the thighs of dusky maidens because only women are employed in the sorting, and most of them are dusky. <laughs> anyway, uh, one of the great pleasures is when you go to the cigar factories, is you find that there is a reader reading from in the morning from the daily newspaper, and in the afternoon from novels. Um, and so this is a tradition that extends back to the 19th century. You can't see it very well, but there's the reader there in his photograph from the late 19th century, and he's doing exactly the same thing. So you're all familiar with the famous Monte Cristo. It's my favorite uh, cigar, by the way, the number three. Uh, it was also Che Guevara's. So, but anyway, the Monte Cristo, where does it come from? It gets its name from the popularity of the Count of Monte Cristo. The cigar lovers like, really enjoyed that book being read to them. Romeo and Julieta, cigar, because they had Shakespeare read to them. Can you imagine? So they've always been considered uh, amongst the most populated, uh, uh, most educated workers in Cuba, and that tradition is maintained. And then you get the colonial uh, legacy, the castles, and the palaces, uh, and the, the convents, and the cobbled plazas, etc. And for me, the, this reaches its epitome amongst the five UNESCO World Heritage Cities in Cuba in the city of Trinidad, which is literally pickled in, well, not literally pickled in aspect, but it is totally changed. There is not a single modern building within the historic core, and it has, of course, been well protected by the Cuban government and restored, and it's a lived-in kind of museum. Uh, and there, forget cars, it's all horses and burros and donkeys in the streets. Uh, and so this is one other aspect of this time warp sense that is uh, constant uh, part of your travel experience in Cuba. So speaking of the colonial legacy, uh, the greatest uh, extent of that is in Old Havana. So the early city of Havana founded in 1514. You can imagine since the revolution, 
very little urban development there. So uh, an urban enclave that was very, very uh, depressed, derelict almost, at the time of the revolution would have been bulldozed. There was a plan to bulldoze most of the old city and put up high rises and whatnot, and that was saved by the revolution. And um, whilst they would clearly not have bulldozed this beautiful cathedral, and hopefully not this plaza, the plaza would not look like it does today. At the end, well, it was still in process, after a three decade uh, process of urban restoration, which is ongoing to this day. And so the main plazas have all been restored, and it's a beautiful project ongoing. Um, and so there is a, a, a scale, if you will, of importance that determines what these buildings uh, will be put to use for. They all have to have commercial value. So the former presidential palace of Batista, the brutal dictator, is, no surprise, the Museum of the Revolution. And then you have secondary level buildings that are beautiful. This is a former bank. It, you can't see it very well, but it's now a hotel dedicated to the Jewish community. There used to be a thriving Jewish community in Old Havana, and this honors that uh, history. And then many of the lesser buildings become boutiques, restaurants, or in this case, homebrew. Austrian company welcomed in, make fabulous beer. So maybe not as good as the Bay Area's home brews, but pretty good, right? So these are what aspects of Cuba you may never imagine. This is your Cuban reality. Beer lovers can go there and get a home brew. And then in Havana, you have hundreds of these old antique horse-drawn carriages. Where on earth they found them, I have no idea. And this is one of the charming aspects. There's, there's something tragic in a sense about the fact that uh, I've taken out what I have in another show where a photograph of people typing on royal typewriters and linotype, etc., because there's no option. There's something tragic about that, but there's also something charming and wonderful about the fact that Cuba uh, still has um, in use, in operation, uh, things that we from reasons of nostalgia look back to and say if only right if only and that is true of the steam trains you still find some s steam trains in operation so had you gone to cuba 10 years ago you would have found many of them in fact only china had more operating steam trains than cuba but in 2002 the cuban government began to run down the sugarcane industry because these were used to draw sugarcane from the fields to the processing plants and of course, most of the steam trains have been taken out of circulation and are now museum pieces. And you cannot understand anything about Cuba unless you understand uh, the importance of sugar in its history. Uh, let me add that if you, I, I'm, I won't continue to pitch the Moon Cuba Guidebook, but I have a tremendous amount of background information. If I am piquing any of your, your interest in history and whatnot, this is profiled in great detail. Uh, in that book. But anyway, in terms of sugar, I call sugar Cuba's bittersweet bondsman because it is responsible for not just slavery, but also tethering Cuba to three great imperial nations through the eons. So firstly, you had uh, uh, Spain, and out into the early 20th century, tethered to the USA, Cuba produced sugar and got American goods in exchange. And then after the revolution, of course, you had the association with the Soviet Union, and Cuba grew sugar to feed the Soviet bear in exchange for all its needs. Um, and it was the wealthiest, um, sugar, well, by far the biggest uh, sugar producer in the world at the end of the 19th century. And Cuba was, in fact, far wealthier than its colonial master, Spain. It was still a colonial country. And it is sugar, the wealth from sugar, that gave rise to the great architectural glories that are self-evident to any traveler in Havana. Uh, and here you're looking at the wedding palace. You can't see it very well, of course. and keep repeating myself there, but um, a glorious expression of architecture. And it was because of this that Cuba was still ruled with a, an iron fist by Spain. Then in 1895, Jose Marti, the national hero, launched the Second War of Independence and martyred himself in the very first battle. Fascinating in Cuba, Cubans are never told that interpretation. 
When I say he martyred himself, he committed suicide. Oh no, that's not what happened. That's absolutely what happened. He set an example that he would give his life. Uh, but when the independence warriors, the army, were on the very verge of winning independence, the USS battle, the battleship USS Maine explodes in Havana Harbor, and that was a pretext for Teddy Roosevelt to lead, didn't lead a cavalry charge, never happened. The victors rewrite the history books, or write the history books, so don't believe anything you read about a cavalry charge, it didn't happen. Yes, Teddy was on horseback, but the troops were on foot. But anyway, this was San Juan Hill, and this is critically important to undertaking us to the revolution, and indeed why there was a revolution, and all the fallout from it. Because after we took command of Cuba, the U.S. military ruled Cuba for four years, Washington wrote a constitution for Cuba. How did you think that constitution looked? Uh, very similar to ours, but very favorable to US economic interests. And by the way, we amended it one year after independence to grant ourselves Guantanamo Naval Base. That's where that came from. And the end result too, this was a period when more than 50% of the economy was bought out by US interests. And this is very, very relevant because whilst there was a period of glory again as the economy recovered, of course it was the United Fruit Company and other American entities that ruled the roost. This is when the period of the Capitol building in Havana was put up, by the way, based obviously, I don't need to say it on Washington's, but it just happens to be two meters taller than ours. Um, and then you had this great expansion of Havana and this awesome, awesome, uh, architectural legacy. Those of you who've been to Havana know quite well there's no place in the world that compares for Beau Art and uh, Art Deco. This is the Bacardi headquarters, I call it the Lego building, um, and modernist buildings that went up with mafia money because the mob had arrived by the 50s. And so this is the Hotel Riviera and remarkable to this day, you go in the Hotel Rivera, Riviera and its lobby is identical to how it was on the eve of the triumph of the revolution. The only thing they've changed is they've upgraded the fabric, the carpet. And so it's all there. There are very few modern skyscrapers, etc. Another aspect of uh, a city trapped in time. And one of the characters back in the 50s who of course made Cuba his home was Ernest Hemingway. He went for the fishing and, let's admit it, the fornication, um, and he settled in, by in 1939, purchased his home that became his principal home in the world. Forget Key West, forget Sun Valley, his home was in Havana, on the outskirts of Havana. And it is retained to this day as the most visited museum in Cuba, the Museum Ernest Hemingway. All the possessions in there were the possessions in situ when Hemingway left Cuba in 1960. And I am very close friends with the director, Ada Rosa, and she treasures keeping this. Uh, and thankfully, in recent uh, months under Obama, uh, there have been new openings that permit the Hemingway Foundation to invest uh, in restoring the building, etc. Uh, then going back to this period, the Hotel Riviera, by the way, was owned by mobster Maya Lansky. And by the late 50s, Cuba was essentially run by the United Fruit Company, the mob, and Batista, right? Uh, and so you can imagine, uh, many Cubans at that time did not like what they were seeing in terms of the way things were going. It may have been an economic good time for most people. Um, and so Havana was indeed the wealthiest tropical city in the world on the eve of the revolution. But, for those of you I will not accepted from any people I hear in Cuba, oh, look at the poverty. What was the poverty like before the revolution? You've been to Haiti? You've been to Kingston, Jamaica? Right, that's poverty. All right, and that's what much of Cuba and Havana looked like. That's the revolution has eradicated all that. And so it was a combination of, of awful slums, homeless people, and of course, Sin City, the flashpot of the world. Um, and Amongst the individuals who did not like that was a young lawyer called Fidel Castro. He was the rising political star in the mid-50s. 
and put himself up for congressional election as a congressional candidate uh, and immensely popular, considered the un incorruptible person who was going to address all these issues. And Batista, who was already in power, having pulled his second coup, wanted legitimacy, popular legitimacy, and therefore held an election in which he stood as presidential candidate. And when it became obvious that he wouldn't win, he canceled the election which meant that this certain young lawyer, Fidel Castro, never had the opportunity to serve in Congress, serve as a senator, and undoubtedly, in my mind, would have won the presidential election in the democratic system. He went to Plan B, right? And so, in 1953, uh, with about 100 uh, compadres, revolutionaries, they launched the initial phase of the revolution with an attack on this barracks in Santiago de Cuba, the very far eastern part of the country. It was a suicidal attack, it failed abysmally. The vast majority of those people captured were tortured to death within 48 hours. Raul was 22, participated, and he and Fidel both uh, were very lucky to escape with their lives. But you may not know it, they were sentenced to 15 years in prison. And they were imprisoned in this prison, but they were so popular. Fidel had such popular support across the broad spectrum of Cuban society who was sick and tired with the tyranny of the Batista regime, etc., that due to popular demand, they were released after two years. But of course, in the context of the era, they would have been assassinated by Batista's hoodlums they left for Mexico, where they met Che, and they trained their army, and they came back to Cuba on this vessel, the Granma, which is enshrined in glass to this day. This is just a model, of course, but the real one is enshrined in glass uh, up behind the Museum of the Revolution in Havana. And there they launched the armed struggle, and this is the headquarters of Fidel for three years, can't see it, sorry, in the mountains, in the highest reaches of the mountains, at the very furthest reach of Cuba, and it is remarkable to think that from this location he succeeded in toppling Batista after three years and came to power. Well, remember the context of the era. This all happened during the height of the Cold War, and as he turned to uh, socialism, putting his reforms in place, there was no way that Uncle Sam would have permitted this to succeed during the Cold War, and especially when the Fidel was allying himself with the Soviet Union, America's principal enemy. So had it been the Bay of Pigs, or had it been some other event, there would have been an American intervention. And one of my favorite moments on the motorcycle journey was at the Bay of Pigs, when I took, went off-road and took a track uh, through the countryside and came across this bullet-ridden uh, B-26 in the undergrowth, and I firmly believe I was the first foreigner to see it. So I'm going to break the context and wake you up, those of you who are snoozing back there, uh, with a little reading from my book about motorcycling through Cuba as I arrive on the motorcycle uh, at the Bay of Pigs. The road ran south like a plumb line, past endless miles of dark green sawgrass and reeds swaying in the wind. I arrived at Playa Larga, a small fishing village tucked into the head of the 20 kilometer long bay where 1,297 heavily armed CIA trained Cuban exiles had come ashore in April 1961 to establish a beachhead and incite a counter revolution that would, that would topple the Castro regime. Concrete monuments lined the roadside. Each one marked the site where a member of the Cuban military, 161 in all, had fallen defending La Revolución during the three-day battle. I passed a youth camp, and through the corner of my eye caught the unflinching gaze of a young communist pioneer peering down from his watchtower. Further south came the crabs. The gravel road was strewn with crustaceans squashed flat by vehicles like giant M&Ms crushed underfoot. Their black carapaces littered the path ahead, and my route was patterned in pointless dots. I dodged around them, avoiding the margins where the razor-sharp shards and pincers of partially crushed crabs stuck up like broken bottles. The air stank of fetid crab meat. I passed my first live crab, bright orange, a newborn, 
Then a large black crab with terrifying red pincers ran across my path, the forerunner of the lethal invasion heading the other way. Suddenly I was surrounded by a battalion of armored surly crustaceans that turned to snap at my tires. I slalomed between them as they rose in the road with menacing claws held high. Then I hit one square on. Poof! It sounded like bubble wrap exploding. <laughs> Finally, I arrived at the climactic spot where socialism and capitalism had squared off. Cuban families and Canadian packaged tourists slathered with suntan oil splashed about in the shallows. My black leathers and boots must have looked absurd. I gave one of the Cubans my camera and asked him to sh snap a shot of me in front of a huge billboard reading Playa Heron, that means bear pigs, the first rout of imperialism in Latin America. It was difficult with the sun beating down on a beach as silvery as mountain snow to imagine that blood and bullets had mingled with the sand and the surf here 35 years before. So, thank you. Uh, so, you know, it was a, a special delight to return with the People to People group and arrive by motorcycle back at the Bay of Pigs a few years ago. And uh, there is a museum there now which tells uh, the heart-rending tale from the Cuban perspective of that great disaster. And what a disaster it was, because you can imagine when the Cuban Revolution happened in 1959, January the 1st, there was a democratic government put in place that the U.S. Uh, acknowledged, recognized in January the 4th. Fidel was not part of that government. Uh, he usurped the process, and um, it, it, the Cuban populists were not ready for socialism at that stage. They were ready to throw out Batista and establish a democratic government. Fidel played his cards carefully, and we handed him on a plate the ability now to first declare the socialist nature of the revolution with the Bay of Pigs. And that happened the day before the invasion and the day after the planes had come in. Oh, five minutes? It's five o'clock. Oh, can I go on? <laughs> All right. Um, he declared the day before the invasion the socialist nature of the revolution, which made it acceptable to a people on the verge of invasion. So he has ever since played the anti-US card, and this is little Elian Gonzalez, mm -hmm. in the hands of Jose Marti, the nationalist hero, mm -hmm. and Jose Marti is pointing an accusatory finger at the US Embassy because Fidel claimed that Clinton administration wanted to keep Elian. Right, that was absurd, we wanted to send him back, but the fanatical Cuban-American family wouldn't permit that and we had to go through the courts. But this is to portray how Fidel liked to portray things. And I was there in front of the embassy at a demonstration, bring Elian back, send Elian back, Wicked USA. And I'm photographing and they said, where are you from? And I said, USA, and they went, oh, we love you. Which is part of the reality of Cuba. They love Americans, right? So um, this was what welcomed American visitors outside the airport. When you arrive in Cuba, there is a terminal exclusively serving Americans, right? Um, and this was right outside the airport, and it says, embargo, the longest running genocide in history. Now, the saw cuts both ways. This is how Fidel loved to present it. By the way, Raul took this down. Uh, but it, the saw cuts both ways. Here is the U.S. Embassy, and under George Bush Jr., our diplomats illegally smuggled electronic gear into Cuba so that we could convert the top floor into a running ticker tape like the Times Square ticker tape to project anti-Castro propaganda. And I'll give you two of them that I remember. One said, some Cubans drive Mercedes, which is a reference to the governmental elite. Some drive Ladas, but most Cubans hitchhike. But my favorite was because this couldn't spell till days, which is the squiggle over the N, Happy New Year became Happy New Anus. <laughs> and these black flags went up within 24 hours, uh, 48 hours. I was in Havana at the time. They built 138 flagpoles. That was 30, 138 years since the first efforts to uh, form independence from Spain. And the black flags went up to 
<laughs> block this out. And Obama, one of the first things he did, thank goodness, was end this nonsense, this childish nonsense. But anyway, so Cuba to this day is very suspicious of Americans. America still has in place an active program to destabilize the Cuban government. And so on the eve of the Bay of Pigs, they formed the Committee for the Defense of the Revolution, which is still there. Initially, their work was to, find, you know, counter, folk was vigilance against counter-revolutionaries. On the National Geographic trips, I take all the groups to visit a CDR. And we get a neighborhood welcome that we receive. We are welcome with open arms. Uh, and this is playing dominoes. Uh, with the locals, saying sure that the doors get open, you go into homes, you, you're one-on-one -on -one with Cubans in their home environment, which I think is an essential component of any Cuban experience. Um, and it teaches you how many people in Cuba actually support the revolution. Don't dismiss the numbers, a huge percentage. I can't put a percentage on it, but this, you can't see it of course, this is Fidel, this is uh, che Guevara, and this is Camilo Simfuegos, the third commandante who died uh, the first year. And this expresses the affection that that person felt. And it's understandable why people have a great affection for the revolution. There were 40% illiteracy in Cuba in 1958. They eradicated that within two years. Cuba is the only Western Hemisphere nation UNESCO acknowledges as having 100% literacy. And they achieved that in a remarkable program that the world should copy, and that is they send 120,000 high school students into the very furthest reaches of the countryside. You, if you were on, as young as 14, you got your parents' permission, you were billeted with campesinos, you didn't come home till they had written a letter to Fidel demonstrating not that they could sign their signature, but they could write a letter. The rest of the world needs that program, right? Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, we have the, uh, the health, right? Everybody has guaranteed access to health. It may not be the best. In fact, some of it is scary. In the recent two years, I've been inside five hospitals, and they have serious problems. What you can't see is that this tray has not been cleaned in since the revolution. So they do have issues, but everybody who did not have access to health care has it, including family visits once a month. So hats off to them for that. Uh, and then gets very little play. They never had a civil rights movement. You can imagine it's a form of slave society with Jim Crow laws just like the states in 1958. Without a civil rights movement from day one top down, they have changed how we look at each other based on the color of our skin in Cuba. And there is no country that has done as exemplary job in terms of equalizing people. Doesn't mean you all have equal income, etc. Blacks still earn less money as a, an average, but nonetheless, uh, you are judged on the content of your character. Hats off one more time to the revolution for that. And it means that the end result is a people who carry themselves with tremendous self-assurance, regardless of their income levels, regardless of their skin color. And if you're in Cuba a short time, you begin to pick up on this wonderful essential component of what the revolution was about. Um, and so they also, therefore, learned how to have a good time on a dime. I've already spoken to the low salaries, etc. Um, and they are not caught up in materialism. And if well, there's one of the changes that disturbs me that I see going on right now, this $3 billion coming out of Miami is almost exclusively white families that left before going to white families still live, living in the old exclusively white zones. And I'm seeing the materialism amongst youth who don't work because they don't have to because uncle in Miami sends the money and they want the Rolex and whatnot. That's seeping in. But the rest of the Cuba can teach you what it really means to value community and having a good time on a dime. So dominoes, ice cream, uh, they're not based on uh, material goods. Their pleasure is taken in really enjoying baseball, right? Uh, the kids after school, they go to play chess, right? There's no such thing as truancy or delinquency. Hands up delinquents as a kid, right? <laughs> right? Doesn't exist in Cuba. They go and play chess. Every community has a chess house and they're very active. 
And of course, the girls still carry on the tradition of Spanish quinceañera, the fiesta de quince, the 15th birthday. The government, you know, the revolution didn't eradicate these beautiful aspects of the colonial past. This is Caribbean communism with a smile, if you will. Um, and, you know, closing down now, it's amazing how happy and cheery so many, the vast majority of Cubans are. Forget what you've read about dour communism, right? Um, and especially not least because they have this wonderful outlet of music and dance. It is in their DNA. Almost every Cuban can play music. If they can't, they can sing. And everywhere you go, you come across these wonderful expressions. You cannot go to a bar or a restaurant without a troupe play, playing for you. Uh, and then you get the Casa de la Trova, the state has endorsed and supported traditional music homes, uh, houses where they keep alive traditional music. So I now close with the last two slides. And um, we can't speak about Cuba music and dance without speaking about the cabarets. So you all done Las Vegas, really it owes its genesis Vegas, well not just to the mob, but to the cabarets, right? And these came out of Cuba. Uh, they have a tradition going back a century. And there is no experience like driving in a convertible car to the Tropicana, the classic cabaret that's been running since New Year's Eve 1939. 200 performers, two hour show, expensive but worth every cent. And I close with an anecdote that really tells you why I so love Cuba. And this was my girlfriend, Mercedes. She and I dated for five years. And as you can see, she was a showgirl at Tropicana. And I described the meeting in this book. I'm not going to read it. I'll just tell you it. Uh, the first date that I had with her, pick her up after the show, and she has shaved her head. She's bald. She's wearing a white turban. She's dressed entirely in white. The only part of her flesh I can see is her face. She's wearing these very colorful necklaces and these metal bangles, and I know instantly what this means. It means she has just been initiated in a secret ceremony that includes animal sacrifice as a santera in the Afro-Cuban Santeria religion. And I know that at that moment she feels that she is literally possessed by uh, her, her Orisha, that is, her, you know, a saint god figure. And that that figure is living inside her, guiding her, and that she is considered sacred by other Cubans. Nobody can touch her, etc. And um, so we take this 50s taxi into Old Havana. This is the special period. There was no gas, no oil, there was no electricity at night. There were 14 hour blackouts nightly, except for Tropicana gets his you know, <laughs> delivery to run the show. And um, as we're driving through these darkened streets, the policeman leapt in front of the car, stopped the car. And uh, out in, in the gloom, I see a man lying in what is clearly a pool of blood. So the policeman is commandeering the taxi to take this man to the hospital. And he hasn't seen Mercedes, who winds down the winger, window, sticks her turbaned head out, and says to him in Spanish, You can't do that. I am Oya. And the policeman touches his collares, his beads. He's clearly a santero and waves the taxi on. I'm thrown in the back seat as the taxi driver hits the gas pedal and I look behind to see the policeman running down the road to look for another taxi and I say to Mercedes, what on earth did you tell him? She says, I told him I was Oya, Santa Teresa, the guardian of the dead and the cemeteries. Had he put that injured man in the car, I might have killed him. Imagine my first date last night in Havana also. Felt a shiver go down my spine. And that is why I call uh, I call this, you couldn't see it, Cuba land of eccentricity and enigma. Thank you very much. Well if only the visuals have been up to far. Um, so, thank you so much for coming. I'm, I'm very happy to take questions. Yes, you had mentioned that uh, groups of four can uh, go in under the education people to people. Where does that uh, restriction come from? Is it the U.S. under the... It, it's written the into the license? regulations that you can go online and look through the OFAC website in the Treasury Department and you will find eventually find it. And the, uh, the Cuban visa, they don't particularly care about that. Don't Cubans know. don't care at all. They welcome, they welcome you. Yeah. Sure. There's no restrictions. By the way, there's no restrictions on where you can travel. 
all that, all those details. By the way, I'm happy to take any question, but any question you throw at me is answered in the Moon Cube book. Yeah, I'm curious about the mental condition of Fidel and what is the relationship with his brother. Okay, excellent question from the front here. Uh, what is Fidel's mental state and what is his relationship with his brother? All all aspects of Fidel's life are official state secrets, right? There's no paparazzi, etc. So much of it is guesswork. I believe that he has on and off aspects of senility, probably. I have no evidence other than his very long absences and then he's trotted out in public. And very recently, he was for the first time gave a, a more full uh, public appearance in which he was quite lucid. Um, so it's guesswork on my part. Um, he is very, very frail. He is coming up next month to his 89th birthday. Um, and his relationship with his brother, well, ostensibly it's quite good. What's fascinating is after Raoul was named provisional president, he immediately launched into talking about the reforms he had in mind. Well, you can imagine, it's not just that Fidel is on the sidelines and may, may still die, but all Fidel's men were in power. And it was almost comic to watch the process that happened for quite some time of Fidel's pronouncements being made public and then the next day kind of retractions of he was misunderstood, misinterpreted. So that was Fidel and or the Fidelistas in the Council of Ministers saying, hey, not an hour turf. And so what Raoul had to do, none of these reforms happened until he accomplished this. He had to replace Fidelistas with Raulistas. All, every single one of the council ministers is now Ra a Raulista. One died, one retired, etc. And now he's getting on with a reform process that Fidel would never have been admitted. So the question remains, what does Fidel feel about that? We do not know. Nobody has access to ask him. But we can only go by the official pronouncements, which are of support. And uh, you read between the lines, those which are clearly written by Fidel have some cautionary messages. He said very recently he does not trust the USA. Period. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Gina, Gina, I'll take so, you next. So it's possible to rent motorcycles. Can you rent motorcycles? Yeah. Um, you actually can, but only from my pal Louise through me. <laughs> the best way is to email me and I'll guide you because, yeah. No, but there's no entity renting motorcycles. The motorcycles we use on the group tours, uh, we can't send motorcycles because of export prohibitions to Cuba. So we, we bring in bikes through other entities that bring their bikes in out of foreign countries and we lease their use. But not as individuals. Yes. Uh, no, Gene, I did yeah, say I'd yeah. get you. Yeah. Is there any connection with Russia anymore? What is the oh, fabulous question. Uh, is there any connection with Russia? Well, America has always been a bit of a bull in the China shop when it comes to foreign policy, right? Uh, the embargo being the classic example, but specific on the embargo, uh, whilst Obama was in these secret negotiations hosted in the Vatican with Cuba, at the same time, we began to chase international banks that were trafficking, US dollars trafficking, uh, through Cuba, because Cuba needs to pay its international obligations. Its own currency is not tradable. So they use US dollars that come in through tourists, etc., to pay their bills. This has to be transacted through international banks. The US terrorism laws affect international corporations. Right, so for many foreign countries, England and Canada, have enacted laws to tell their corporations you may not adhere by U.S. law because it is not internationally legal. But so the USA, what they did, and this I'm going to answer your question, uh, what the USA did in chasing down all these banks, one bank, a French bank, was fined eight billion dollars, and they pay it because they will lose their license to trade in the states and being accused of trafficking with a terrorist nation. What happened? All the international banks pulled out, and who stepped in? Putin arrived in May last year, two weeks after the Chinese premier, and Cuba did deals with, well, the last time I looked, they were our strategic enemies, right? We handed Cuba's credit on a plate to China and Russia. Right? So Russia is in there now, not big time, a lot of Russian tourists, 
Uh, but Russia and China and Brazil are building the massive port at Mariel that will serve the mega ships coming through the Panama Canal when the new blocks open next year. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, how large are the tours that you take and what time of year? Uh, the tours I lead for National Geographic expeditions, there are 25 maximum. Uh, most of mine go pretty much full. The minimum would be about 12 people. We run weekly, November through end of June. Less frequently May and June because it's hot. Um, and the motorcycle tours, we have 12 departures slated for next year, November through April. Oh my goodness. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I don't know how few is. Uh, give everybody else a fair shake. Choose your favorite question. Oh gosh, well, I have a couple of them. Um, there are a couple of uh, transportation companies, public transportation companies. Uh, there's a visit via Zoo and the um, Astros. Do you know which one's the more reliable? Uh -huh. Well, you are not allowed to use Astro, which has been renamed. You are a foreigner. Astro is the domestic bus service. It's now been renamed, but no foreigners are permitted to use it. What so forget it. You're, you're restricted exclusively to Via Azul, yes. which is a very good company, but it just does the main cities and main resorts. Okay, and then are there any uh, city tours? Oh, by the way, all this is answered in the Moon Cuba Guidebook. Uh, <laughs> this is the kind of prep. Let, let me just say, all right, I'm going to... I'm just going to say this. If you ask me a practical detail like this, I'm not going to answer it. Okay, no problem. Okay. I have another one. <laughs> auto parts. Can I bring in a small iPhone? Yes, you may bring in small auto parts. That's now allowed. It's not multiple. Auto one, two of each. But if I have, is there certain ones that they're looking for? I've been watching the... An auto part is fine. If somebody, if somebody's going to... Unless you have somebody in mind who needs... No, I don't. Right, no, they, they, they'll welcome it. Huh. Question, a personal question. Uh, where were you born and where do you live now? Uh, I was born in northern England, Yorkshire, coal mining area. I live in Palm Springs, Southern California. I belong in the Bay Area. Okay. Yeah. 25 wonderful years in Oakland. Yeah. And that's where I should Come still back. be. Yeah. Come back. Where will you be? The other thing is all other countries can go as tourists, it's just the United States. Yes, the USA is the only country. <coughs> so they can go tours, but not an American. Ma'am. I have a comment and a question. We were talking about the church's relationship with Cuba. And I bought a poster, I think the Museum of, of the City of Havana, uh, in the late 90s, that showed John Paul II and Fidel Castro. And Fidel Castro was actually wearing a three-piece suit, which mm -hmm. I thought was remarkable. But they were selling it in the museum, so mm -hmm. clearly the church was, you know, was involved for many, many years uh, in that. But I have a question. Where is the best place to find guaracha, the dance music? Guaracha, the dance music? Or the home. If you wanted to go to the home of guaracha. Um, I'm not sure where regionally that's from in Cuba, frankly. But any place that you would go to? That no, that's that, that music form is unknown to me. Really? Sorry. But let me clarify something on the religious thing. You're mentioning the Pope. Um, I never once saw the cathedral doors in Havana open until the Pope's visit in 98. There was uh, considerable religious persecution that had begun, to, had begun to lift by the 90s, but it still existed. And when Pope John Paul came in 98, he asked for and got liberalization and so now I would say there is pretty much zero religious persecution. Go ahead. Follow on to the personal question, why are you in Palm Springs? Uh, bad, bad real estate decision. I intended to make a killing on my two properties and come back to the Bay Area. I lost my ass. Uh, well, um, as a journalist, you just go and tick off the box saying you're going for journalist purposes, like you, all 12 categories are equal. You just literally book your flight and tick off the box you are going as a journalist. It's based on an honor system. That's all it is. You are pre-approved. Lovely to see you too. Um, a quick question. Um, 
You know, I work with women's rights all over. I was in Cuba about 17 years ago, went with Global Exchange, and we visited a lot of programs where they were helping women get out of prostitution into other kinds of, of um, careers. And the problem is, as more capitalism develops, that the idea of being able to make $100 or $1,000 a night versus you know, $12 a month um, is a challenging one. So I'm wondering how you're seeing that. I haven't been back in you know, over 15 years. How are you seeing that develop and as um, the doors open more? Well, as you know, I don't think there's a country in the world that has freed itself from prostitution, period. Mm -hmm. Not going to happen in our lifetime. Um, and what I've seen is that question in Cuba, which I write about extensively in here, <laughs> at great cost in terms of my relationship with the Cuban government. Okay. I say they kick-started tourism, the Cuban government, by sponsoring sex tourism. I have not changed my opinion. And um, so it is tolerated. Uh, officially not, but reality is. Um, it's always there, but it takes a very different form than most of the countries we associate with prostitution. Call this number and, you know, the girl shows up for an hour or whatever. That's not the way it works in Cuba. And in the Moon Cuba guidebook, <laughs> I have an entire section called Prostitution or Permissiveness, right? And I explain it within the cultural context of Cuba. I'm not going to go into it by the guidebook and you'll read all about it, right? But I do explain that at length. It is a cultural phenomena that is not easily explained and it nor easily defined what is prostitution and not in Cuba, right? Very complex answer. Ma'am? Would you explain again the Russian connection in Cuba? Would I explain it? Well, Russia is now in as a major creditor to Cuba and is there investing in Cuba in certain industrial arenas so, and including the construction of a major port at Mario. So. Uh, I read a while back that the Cuban government uh, discouraged tourists from getting out and ming mingling among the local people. They like the tourists to stay in the tourist enclaves to spend a lot of money. Total nonsense. Well, Total absolute nonsense. Right. Now, I, I should, now, um, I, I, sh I will take that back in some degree. There was a period one one sense that um, there, there were include, there were many years ago when I started going exclusive zones where Cubans could not enter beach resorts. That was lifted. Okay. okay. Um, Fidel put in place that Cubans could not enter hotels over the sex tourism issues, right? When sex tourism was big in Cuba in the mid-90s, in 96, Fidel, in a very famous speech, said, we don't permit this, we don't, we're not going to allow it, we're closing the hotels. That was the very same day they created the private room rental license where they never didn't want to lose the business and where you could always take your partner. They took it out of the lobbies into a private arena. That's all they did. So I could, I could yeah. go... Uh, you can go. There is no restriction where you can go in Cuba. So I can go like rent a room and board for some little person that wants yeah. to make a little money? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. That is the way to go. Yeah, I know. Why are you going to stay in a hotel when you can have a Cuban experience, become family, I agree. make friends, I agree. learn Cuban mean? reality? This is sorry if that logic is in your book, I know. Is your email address also in your book? Yes, my website is ChristopherBaker.com. Okay. My email is there under contact. Okay, cool. That's the easiest way to go. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am, at the back. Yes. Um, I will buy your book. And <laughs> <laughs> Hooray, at last. <laughs> yes, of course you can rent your own car. Yeah. Good luck for the Cuban Americans who are flooding in and renting them all. <laughs> You're a quick learner. <laughs> so, yeah, I have both of these books. Uh, <laughs> oh. did, did everybody hear that? 
So you mentioned credit cards. I understand credit cards are not acceptable in, in any. Okay. In, okay. Thank you for raising that. And also. What is the best currency? Is it euros or U.S. dollars? Okay, good, very good. Uh, again, this is a practical question that you have in the book, so uh, yeah. you caught me with, between a rock and a hard place. I did say I read it. All right, so um, <laughs> Obama lifted the restrictions on U.S. credit cards. They can be used in Cuba, but they're not functioning now. It's going to take a while before the financial institutions actually make it happen. Uh, as to currency, you are going to be charged a 10% surcharge Ooh, on your US dollars. So just before you go, so you don't get caught by an adverse shift in the exchange rates, you get hold of euros or Canadian dollars and you are charged the mere 3% instead of the 3 plus 10. All right, I, I'd say maybe last question, Al? Yeah. <laughs> All right, no, I will take some more until I get kicked out. Oh. Uh, is there a uh, classic car organization, and what is the uh, situation with the Buena Vista Social Club? Okay, yes, there are several classic car associations in Cuba, but one principally is called the Classic Car Club of Havana. Um, and so they, do, they meet every Saturday by the Hotel Nacional. <laughs> Uh, as to Buena Vista Social Club, uh, there are only two of the principal members alive. Uh, Omar Apofuando is still performing, but barely able to. And then Eliades Ochoa, who is a friend of mine, is um, still performing and got long life ahead of him doing so. There are three bands in Havana that play under the title of Buena Vista Social Club. <laughs> And they are all old timers of that era playing that music. Okay, nobody's kicking me out, so we'll keep going. So, uh, some Americans have traveled from Canada and Mexico to Cuba. What has happened to them because of their travels? Um, so you said Americans or Canadians? Americans? They've gone to Canada. Okay. Canada. Well, um, the USA knows if you've been because. Cuba is on the terrorist nation list. Any airline flying to Cuba had to share its manifest <coughs> with the USA. So they know if you've been. Uh, under Bush, what they started to actually chase people down. There has never been a, a judicial process in place except for three months under Bush when they just two people fined. One of them was a guidebook author, by the way. Wow. Um, um, and other people who have, doesn't happen under Obama anymore, but under Bush, a lot of people received notifications of intent to levy a fine. That was the official title from OFAC. We believe you have traveled without a license to Cuba, right? And it is written as if you are being fined $7,500. You can be fined $55,000. Uh, and a lot of people paid up. You could kill it dead. And so if... Marco Rubio gets presidents in as president, expect to have these letters start again, and you kill it dead because the National Lawyers Guild has a page, and I have this in Moon Cuba, how to deal with it, it's all there. I told you you can't throw a question at me without it answered there. Um, and I give you the web page and whatnot where they have the letter to reply and kill it dead. Mm. Ah. Hmm. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just returned from Cuba seven weeks ago, and Coming through San Francisco, SFO, nobody asked me any questions. I brought back a lot of Cuban art and cigars and rum, and the customs said nothing. I was just totally. Yes, they've been told hands off. Yeah, I just walked right through. Did you declare it? They are bureaucrats. You have to understand immigrate, well, immigration less so. They're under yeah, Homeland was, Security. I was like, nobody asked me anything. Yeah, but with customs, the word yeah. has gone down from it's Obama. Amazing. Hands off. Yeah, it was amazing. Did you go independently? Uh, no, I went with people to people. Okay, so yeah. that's why. I wanted to ask about choosing between going with a people to people group versus going independently. It seems now if you could fit in one of those categories pretty much, you can go on your own. But there may be advantages to people-to-people -people groups. So I wondered about your thoughts. They're often very Well, I'd say, yes, so vis-a-vis -vis whether to go with people-to-people -people or on your own, 
it depends to what degree you want a real uh, uh, educational experience in terms of having information presented to you that you're not going to get. Uh, and in that you have to be very selective and careful about what people to people program you go with because based not least on budget, not exclusively, but the client makeup differs between organizations. So with National Geographic, uh, obviously we get highly educated, usually high income, intent on learning people. And a lesser income program, I won't name any names, has I know by experience and from what my Cuban tour guides they work with tell me, uh, tends to draw a mix of people, some of whom think they're just going to go and hit the mojito bars, right? Mm -hmm. So your your peers within any group will uh, define what your experience <coughs> is like and as based on who they are as much as what the content is. So the one thing I like about people to people, you really do have a broad span of enrichment program laid out already for you. And there is enough time, usually, for you to go and do your own thing intermingling with Cubans. National Geographic. You were Sue, I remember. Yes, I'm thinking, who is that? I know them. <laughs> cigars as good as they used to be. It depends on the year. All right, follow aficionado. I'm no cigar aficionado, but the magazine reviews. Um, and what happens is year by year, production varies. Of course, Cuba, the Cuban um, tobacco land is in the principal hurricane zone. So that hurricane weather, obviously, like the vineyards around here, the years vary based on climatic conditions. Uh, but also based on production goals. So Cuba has outreached itself by trying to meet international demand, has started to bring in lesser trained workers, and the quality goes down. Cigar aficionado writes that up, people stop buying Cubans and go to Nicaraguans, etc. And the, the, so they have to bring the quality up. So it varies. Uh, they still are right up there, but if you go to Cigar aficionado, You'll see that Nicaragua, Honduras, and Dominican Republic are equal to Cuban these days. You've got to be a real aficionado to care about that question. Have you any favorite contemporary Cuban authors uh, writing either in Spanish or in English? Authors, I um, guess. You know, I'm a little bit out, out of sync with the, the newer ones. I was reading a lot of Cuban novels a few years ago. Um, Christina Garcia, of course, had a, a recent one that well, both of her novels I love. Um, I'm having name blanks. Sorry. Next. Did you, did you read Leonardo Padura? I have not read it. I've just, I bought one of his books and I've yet to read it. Okay. I was curious about you there. Yeah. So. What are the attitudes toward gays by both the government and Okay, great question. What is the attitude towards gays by government and community? Great question. Is anybody familiar with the movie Fraser y Chocolate? Strawberry and Chocolate? Yes, of course. Okay, so we open, Nat Geo, we open the first night at the place that that was filmed. All right, La Guarida, Paladal, a private restaurant. And um, I give the whole story. Uh, and it's, it's quite fascinating because that movie, the reason I'm raising that movie, 1995 when it was released, it is set in the mid-70s during the era of persecution of gays. And that is the only word that could be used for it. You lost your job, you couldn't teach, etc. Uh, if you were gay. Um, and that began to ease up. Um, 
just about a decade ago. Uh, in, in my first decade of going to Cuba, I was witness to a lot of persecution of gays. Um, and then it began to ease up. But then what's happened recently, they have come full circle because at the forefront of the effort to get gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community accepted fully on all levels is Raul Castro's daughter, Mariela. And she heads the Sex Education Center, which in Cuba is a big institute, uh, and is leading that effort. So institutionally, there's now no persecution. There is certainly no persecution within the community, but there's still a lot of machismo. So that is going to be a multi-generational problem to break down the machismo of traditional attitudes outside the city. The gays are way out of the closet in Havana and in some of the cities. There are the Cuban government sponsors a gay pride uh, parade every year. Um, and there is an effort led by Mariela to get uh, gay weddings accepted as legal in Cuba. And because of her position, it will happen. It will happen. So there's been tremendous advance in the last 10 years. Since before night falls. Yes, yeah, so there are many movies on this theme, Before Night Falls, uh, etc. Do you know if the uh, charter lines going into uh, Cuba from Miami will book a ticket for you if you're not flying on one of, or excuse me, you're not going to be participating in one of the uh, People to People programs that have a specific license? Let me repeat. Yes. <laughs> Let me repeat. You are pre-authorized to go if you state based on belief that you fall within one of those 12 criteria and you need nothing, do nothing more than check off a box that the airline company will give you affirming that you are going for one of these 12 reasons. You check it off and you step on the plane. The reason I End of story. The reason I ask that is I've called several and they all want to know what people to people program you're going to be flying on. Basically. Well, people to people is different because you cannot go on your own. Yes. As a journalist, you go on your own. As a religious figure, you go on your own. People to people, you must go with an entity running a people to people program or arrange your own people to people program for you and your pals through such an entity. Through such an entity, what entity? Any travel entity. Oh, okay. But you have to be four, right? Minimum. Minimum. Yeah. Four. Mm -hmm. uh, is what access? Internet access, Internet access is, uh, has been, now it's a very fascinating story, because it has traditionally been very restricted for two reasons. The first is that, yes, it, you, the state controls all media and has been very restrictive on access to information other than what the government has wanted to put out there. That is lightening up significantly right now. And that means that you could not get a permit as was required uh, to have, or, or rather to have internet in your house, you would need government permission, right? Now, I support the Cuban government's claim that they were restricted in their ability to do it because they didn't have the broadband clip. Why? Because the US embargo prevents Cuba from accessing all the international telecommunications systems, fiber optics, etc. So there are both things in play there. Things are changing rapidly right now. Last month they opened the first public Wi-Fi zone in Havana. Right? And uh, now it's, it's just $2 an hour, which is less than half the price that you pay for Wi-Fi in the hotel. So if you are a Cuban with a, a computer and it's under Raul, you can now buy laptops and computers. If you're a Cuban, you go in, you have to go to a zone where there is Wi-Fi wi access and buy one of the cards that everybody has to use because there's just one single Cuban state entity has a monopoly. And if you have the money to buy that card, you get access and use it. So the hotel lobbies are full of Cubans with their iPads and whatnot. But now they're opening up zones. They've opened up a lot more internet cafes, but the demand is far greater than the ability. That last year they permitted Cubans with cell phones to access the internet too. 
but you have to be in one of the zones, right, which were exclusively within hotels. So now they're opening up public on the street zones. There are a couple of parks, and they're putting that across the nation. But they do not have the bandwidth, and of course Obama has said that any telecommunications company can now deal with Cuba. So hopefully that will permit the Cuban government to lighten up, because I've always said uh, the belief that America has that if we squeeze them, they will squeak, huh. has actually had the opposite effect, especially dealing with a personality type like Fidel, but also his brother. Cuba is not going to respond to threats by the USA. And it is showing that it willingness to lighten up as we lighten up. I've said, you lighten up on Cuba, they'll lighten up. It doesn't mean we're going to get to a multi-party democracy anytime soon. I don't have that crystal ball. But we're seeing that now. The Cuban government is lighting up, and there's much more internet access um, within Cuba. Yes? Sebastopol, just up the road from here, is having its first Cuban film festival next weekend. Friday and Saturday, the 24th and 25th. There's food, music, films, and a film director coming all the way from Havana. Oh, cool. Boy, I wish I were here. Sonoma County Film Festival. Does anybody wish me to sign a book? All right. Book signing time. Buy your books and come here. Thank you so much.